this thing very thought provoking and although dealing with with the US so far away has a straight uh, impact on Israeli society I think and things happening here um, okay so we'll turn we'll keep questions and comments for the end but we'll turn to our yeah, third and last speaker in this panel, Dr. Gershon um, Guntonvik. Usually the, the Israeli name are, are easier to pronounce. He teaches constitutional law and administrative law at the Carmel Academic Center in, ha in Haifa. In Haifa. Um, he's also an active practitioner at the partner, uh, as a partner in a well-known uh, yeah, law firm, which is uh, Weinroth, Jacob Weinroth uh, in Israel. Um, he published uh, a lot of articles with, um, regarding the, yeah, the dilemma, the very interesting question uh, where Israel is facing as a Jewish and democratic state, which raised the question for itself. It can can it a state be, yeah, be a Jewish and democratic altogether? Uh, he also write about criminal and contract law. Recently, um, he published a book we, who, which is going to discuss, and I think it's very interesting from reading the, all the, the introduction and the summary uh, preparing to this panel. Um, the book is Housing Discrimination Culture and Culture Groups between, between Legal Walls and Social Fences in Israel. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the conference organizer for inviting me to take part in this conference and especially I would like to thank uh, Dr. Finkelstein. Um, I would address the topic of housing discrimination, not as a social right as uh, Justice Donner discussed, but on the mere equality issue. And uh, I would like to convince you that in Israel, even the equality issue, which Justice Donner said that it was quite simple, uh, it's not so simple. Not so simple, and I will try to uh, convince you uh, why. Now, um, basically, we are talking about the basic situation. A refuses to sell or rent his dwelling to B because of B's cultural identity. I don't want to sell you because you are African American. I don't want to sell you because you are ultra orthodox. I don't want to sell you because you are a Jew, a Muslim. I mean, the topic is a refusal to sell or to rent an apartment due to the cultural identity, national identity, uh, racial grounds, color, uh, religious uh, affiliation, and all kinds of issues like that. Now, this kind of question, uh, my point is that this kind of question cannot be addressed without taking into account the group dynamics behind this question. Because when one single dwelling owner, let's say a Jewish dwelling owner, refuses to sell or rent his apartment to an Arab potential buyer, this is a reflection of the general relationships between Jews and Arabs in the society. And uh, the same is true with regard to religion and secular, uh, every kind of division. Um, so basically when we're trying to figure out which is the right way to govern housing discrimination issues, we are basically asking the question, which is the right way to address the issue of the contact <coughs> between cultural groups in a given society? Um, before I will address this issue, first of all, um, and uh, corresponding to the previous lecture, if the state in a multicultural society will do nothing it will not uh, pass any kind of housing uh, laws or the courts will do nothing. In a tense society, in a tense relations between cultural groups, the result would be segregation. The result would be social segregation, even without uh, the case doing anything. And the causes for such segregation uh, can be varied. I mean, there can be uh, bad causes for it. Let's say social discrimination. For example, you mentioned the part, the part that uh, African Americans travel to the north. Uh, in many instances, they received, you, you mentioned the welcome in the uh, train station, but in many instances, they received violent welcome. 
the moment uh, some try to enter so-called white neighborhoods. Um, and even without violent means, in many instances, white uh, dwelling owners refused to uh, sell or rent uh, the dwellings to the new newcomers because they were African Americans. Um, so there is an issue of pure discrimination which stands behind the social segregation. Uh, there are all kinds of economical uh, factors as well, uh, naturally. Um, but the phenomenon is not necessarily bad. Take, for example, a situation in Israel, let, let's say an ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish neighborhood. Haredim, uh, as we call it here, but ultra-Orthodox Jews. Now, they want to live together in order to, in some sort of homogeneous uh, surroundings, in order to fulfill their culture in this kind of surroundings. Now, some would consider this kind of behavior as a um, part of the right, uh, right to culture. I mean, we have the right to live together with our same kind, to fulfill our uh, religious uh, behavior, and this is why we want to live together. And this is why we will not sell our houses to secular potential buyers. Um, so the, the, the phenomenon is not necessarily, not necessarily all uh, evil, or even without the cultural dimension. Let's, take, let's talk about immigrants. Usually when new immigrants come to land, they want to go to uh, neighborhoods in which for, uh, former immigrants came. I mean, uh, Roy Brooks, I think, uh, uh, referred to the Jewish experience uh, in coming to America in New York. The Jewish neighborhoods in New York, the Italian neighborhoods in New York, the Irish neighborhoods in New York, uh, they were created socially without a direction from the state. And the new immigrants found comfort in their uh, predecessors and together they try to, this is except for the romantic uh, way that Brooke uh, emphasizes this thing, they find comfort together, they actually um, make their uh, process of becoming Americans more easy. Um, so it's not necessarily such a bad thing, the segregation does not equal discrimination necessarily. So here again um, we come to the question again how should we classify a refusal of A to sell or rent uh, his dwelling to B? Now, to, in order to answer the question, we have to decide what kind of contact are we aspiring for in relations between the cultural groups. Uh, my claim is that if we want to force contact, or if we want to force integration, <coughs> then we will classify the refusal as discrimination. Because when we are classifying this refusal discrimination, we're basically saying you cannot refuse letting one, for example, African-American into the neighborhood, but we cannot, again, think about it in just one uh, land law perspective. We think about it with the cultural dynamics. I mean, we, what, we, what we are enabling one land on, uh, landlord, we are enabling the whole class of landlords. So if we are saying you cannot refuse legally to sell or rent your apartment to an African-American or to a white or to a religious, we're basically saying we're trying to force a contact between such groups. Um, perhaps not, not so successfully, perhaps the legal measures are not so uh, equipped to deal with this issue, but this is our aim. This is the way we see the relations between the relevant cultural groups comparing, for example, American society in America. Uh, the combination, if I uh, got the legal situation right, the combination between the Fair Housing Act and Section 1920, 1982 uh, basically means that a single landlord cannot refuse uh, the selling or renting of an apartment back, uh, based on uh, racial grounds. Even if, for example, he's renting a, a room in his apartment while, con while continuing living in the apartment. So the American uh, motion of relations between African Americans and whites, legally speaking at least, is committed to the issue of integration um, between those groups. But when we are going to the Israeli experience, it is not so clear that this is the model that the Israeli society wants to adopt. I mean, should we want in Israel to force a connection or to force integration between 
ultra-Orthodox Jews and seculars, or between Jews and Arabs, given the both sides of the equation, both Arabs are national minority. A lot of Israeli Arabs want to fulfill their livelihood in an all Arab surroundings. And a lot of Jews want to do it as well. Um, so the implementing the <coughs> issue of integration by many Israeli scholars considered to be not so appropriate, I mean forced integration, not so appropriate uh, to the Israeli context. But that does mean that we should opt for an option of separation. And the question is, not necessarily. And this is the complication, I think, about which I want to uh, raise. I want to distinguish between legal, legal segregation and social segregation. I mean, if we will reject the issue of integration, we can have social segregation. I mean, the segregation will be done relevant to all kinds of causes, but we can also have legal segregation, contracts, covenants, things like that. Or even the state building a municipality just for ultra-Orthodox Jews. In Israel, for example, when the state build a municipality just for ultra-Orthodox Jews and forbid by law the entrance of non-ultra-Orthodox Jews to the municipality, this was upheld by the Supreme Court as equal due to the right to culture of the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel. So in Israel, we are facing a situation in which the Supreme Court basically recognized legal segregation in one specific context as a legal. Now, I should call a social segregation as, legal fe as a social fences and legal segregation as legal walls. And my claim is that given the bad implementations, the bad uh, results of segregation, even in Israel, we should usually nullify legal walls and not recognize the legality of legal walls. Even if we won't have legal walls, we'll still have uh, social segregation. And then the question is, how should we deal with social segregation? But legal walls are very bad for multicultural society. All kinds of legal walls. Public legal walls and private legal walls. Private legal walls, for example, the racial covenants we just heard about. This is a mechanism of private entities basically um, enacting some sort of a legal uh, covenant which takes away their discretion. I mean, if I am under a legal covenant and I want to sell my apartment to an African-American, I cannot because there is a restrictive covenant. If the court will, up, will upheld the restrictive covenant, then I am not in a position to, uh, to sell or rent my uh, dwelling. But there can be also public legal walls. As I mentioned again, the state builds a, a different entity for ultra-Orthodox Jews. And I think you mentioned the uh, problems with the uh, private part of these kind of legal walls, but I think naturally that when the state does it, it's much more severe. Because private actors, we can say, well, they have the right to autonomy, even if I'm not in agreement with them, I not necessarily will interfere in their uh, conduct. But state actors must always act in a normative manner. <coughs> So if the state says it's okay to legally force separation between groups, that means that this notion is normatively justified. And this is a tremendous signal to the society because if the state can do it, why shouldn't I? Uh, so when state does it, the, the implementations, the applications are uh, very, very uh, tremendous. Now, if we accept this distinction, then usually the court should nullify legal separation. And I, for example, think that the Israeli Supreme Court move, which authorizes the creation of ultra-Orthodox cities, is very damaging to the Israeli society. 
Um, and we can see the results in Bet Shemesh. Bet Shemesh, for example, is a city not far from Jerusalem where there are clashes between ultra-Orthodox and secular uh, population. It's two different cities altogether. One cannot even t take the possibility to imagine a situation in which ultra-Orthodox Jews and secular Jews living together. It's unimaginable in the situation currently in Israel, and this is a shame because ultra-Orthodox Jews are going to be a very important part of the Israeli society. And the, the way to administer the relations between secular and ultra-Orthodox in Israel is very important. And I think that the court did not make the distinction between the legal separation and the social separation. Even if there will be no legal separation, there will still be Jewish neighborhoods and there will still be ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods, but there will be a much considerable amount of contact between seculars and ultra-Orthodox. I, for example, live in Ramat Gan. Ramat Gan is not far from here. Uh, and right next door is the city of Bnei Brak. The city of Bnei Brak is a city composed mostly of ultra-Orthodox Jews. And I live right on the borderline. And daily I see, from my perspective, wonderful uh, sites in which youngsters, ultra-Orthodox youngsters go to Ramat Gan, get acquainted with the general surrounding. They will not cease to be ultra-Orthodox but they will be more open to the general society. And even if there are conflicts, the contact is very, very vital for building a healthy society in Israel. And take, for example, this ultra-Orthodox city that the Supreme Court authorized. It's a city far from everybody else, composed 100% of ultra-Orthodox Jews. There is no contact. For example, El Ad, for example, uh, Beitar Elit, uh, for example, neighborhoods in uh, Bet Shemesh, not far from Bet Shemesh, uh, new neighborhoods in Bet Shemesh. No contact. And the lack of contact, I think, is very harmful to building a healthy relationship uh, in uh, Israel. So I think that the court uh, basically did not give due weight to the separation between legal separation and social separation. Uh, it rejected the notion of integration and opt out immediately for the legal separation without considering what is the difference between legal separation and social separation. And I think it should have been remained with the social separation and not authorize the legal separation, um, actually, with regard to this issue. Now, I'm talking just about uh, private <coughs> dwelling owners. I'm not talking about contractors or people who are the business in the housing industry, uh, contractors, uh, financiers in banks or insurance companies. This is a, a separate issue and I think that under Israeli law one can impose legal duties upon them by using open clauses like uh, good faith clauses and things like that. I'm talking only about the situation of the owners of uh, dwellings. Now, if I will address, um, I was not planning to, but I think I will finish by addressing uh, uh, your lecture. Um, Shelley versus Kramer, I think, uh, in the United States, you mentioned also Buchanan, I think. Buchan the Buchanan, this is the judgment from 1917. Uh, but let's focus about Shelley versus Kramer. Shelley versus Kramer, to my understanding, in the United States, uh, jurisprudence is a very problematic. When was it? In 48. Uh, I think it's the first on the first page of the relevant uh, U.S. Uh, report. Um, it's a very problematic case under U.S. jurisprudence because they went for the issue of state action. And it's a very problematic uh, base, a theoretical base for such a judgment because take, for example, a situation in which, um, in another private situation, um, I am writing a will and a in, under which I am giving all of my property to my son and not to my daughter, which is discriminatory. Suppose even I will write in the will that I'm doing so because I think that uh, women are not equal to take care of uh, property issues. Well, I'm a discriminatory person. I have no moral uh, structure. Should the court enforce such a will? If you are going with the Shelley Doctrine directly, no. Because then the court is being involved in enforcing a discriminatory uh, instrument. But I think in a lot of um, United States states, the will will be enforced due to the issue of personal autonomy and things like that. 
I think that the distinction between social segregation and legal segregation is the most sander base to get the results that Shelley got. It will miss the educational uh, aspect that you highlighted. But I think due to the um, problems with this kind of doctrine, with this kind of instrument, with uh, racial covenants, uh, which are basically legal segregation, they should be uh, nullified. And it's quite interesting, I think, to know that in the same years in Canada, there were also all kinds of uh, restrictive covenants issues. Some courts nullified them because they were against the public policy. If they are against public policy, then you don't have the trouble of trying to uh, actually uh, be governed by them later on because they are nullified, totally. Not just the enforcement, but the basis is nullified. And under my approach, the base should be nullified. Not just the enforcement, but the base at all, because this is a problematic and <coughs> very uh, harmful uh, legal segregation. Um, eventually, if I re remember correctly, the Supreme Court of Canada basically decided in such a case on a property law doctrine of touch and concern. They just said that these uh, covenants don't touch and concern the land. So you have a contractual uh, obligation, but you don't have a property law obligation. It doesn't uh, rent for it. So if I will try to summarize, and that will be my ending uh, remarks, I think that basically we should distinguish between integration or motivation for integration, distinguish between social separation, and distinguish between uh, legal separation. In Israel, as opposed to the United States, I think that the relationship, the delicate relationship between the social components of the Israeli society, um, with such a surrounding, we should reject a mandatory contact uh, between the uh, different groups. We should reject mandatory integration. Uh, we should reject mandatory separation. We should reject mandatory separation, and therefore a lot of the Israeli Supreme Court cases which allow mandatory separation are very dubious in my uh, perspective. And with regard to social separation, this is a bit more complicated, um, and practically we should allow social separation. We, sh we perhaps can promote integration as opposed to forcing integration. We should promote integration but not force integration between ultra-Orthodox and uh, secular Israelis and between Jews and uh, Arabs. Thank you.